Uh, Michael Herman from Kingston University. Um, I was just curious about your thoughts about the Green Guide to specification, because I don't know how it will be with Briam in the next incarnation, but at the moment in the material section, it largely refers back to the Green Guide specification, and I just wondered if you'd comment on that. Um, my information is, I think I'm right in saying that the Green Guide specification is going to be um, omitted in favour of life cycle and um, embodied carbon. Hi, uh, Ronan Lane from Bioregional. Uh, Simon, it's probably a question for you, but I'd be interested in a client's perspective as well. Uh, you mentioned the grid decarbonisation and whether or not to deal with grid decarbonisation in your whole life assessments. So taking the WWF uh, headquarters example where you looked at the triple glazing, in that particular case, did you consider decarbonised grid in the, uh, or, or did you not? And how would you advise people when they are making those decisions as clients? Well, I, I, I'll, I'll answer first and I'll hand over to the client. I think <clears throat> the answer is yes, we did allow for grid decarbonisation. Um, and the reason for that is because it's government policy and there is a, a, a trajectory. But as I, I, as I mentioned, the standard EN 15978 does not allow for grid decarbonisation. So if you're doing uh, an assessment to comply with EN 15978, you should not include grid decarbonisation. Um, in fact, uh, so from my perspective, it seems that we should, what we decided to suggest is that, is that you do both, um, because otherwise um, you're kind of skewing things, and, and, and if, you're, if, you're, if you're including for grid decarbonisation on a fairly modest trajectory based on the national grid's projections, that seems a reasonable thing to do. Does anybody want to add to that? Yeah, I think for us it's just a completely separate exercise. So when we're thinking about carbon in the supply chain and what potential emissions we might create through our design choices, that's one exercise. And then the energy efficient design of the building is, 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 is another. Um, and we don't really feel the need to compare the two because what does that tell us? Do you see what I mean? So, so we're saying, okay, let's make some sensible material choices so that we can reduce the intensity of our future emissions, stages A1 to A5 from the RICS guidance, and then separate team, separate consultant team, which is you know the sort of traditional sustainability consultant. Let's work with our energy managers, you know, operational teams, designers, etc., on thermal efficiency and all the kind of classic stuff to work out how efficient will this building be. Um, it's it's only if you really want to do a a, 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 a life cycle analysis, and you, you really want to know, and you have to know, and you want to be able to balance the, 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 the sort of the, the, the whole life emissions with the embodied emissions. That you really need to answer that question, if you see what I mean. So we see them as separate things, because of course, when the building is switched on, we're then counting those emissions through GHG protocol and everything else. So we'll sort of worry about it later, if you see what I mean. Climate change is the problem now. So for me, we should be focusing on A1 to A5 material choices, procurement. And not worrying about grid decarbonisation or not, because we can't affect that. Um, I've got a question for uh, Andy, and that is to do with, if you'd like maybe just to talk a bit more about the sort of whole life thinking in relation to the way you see the Google building being used. Do you, do you see this as sort of a part of your future culture on, with respect to the building? Well, it's been designed, flexibility was the major part of the brief because we don't, we don't know how we're going to use it in, in, in 10, 15, 20 years' time. So we want to be able to use the brief specifically was any part of uh, the, the KGX building, as we call it, can be used for any purpose. So we're not, we, we don't want to confine ourselves to, to uh, specific uses for prolonged periods. We want to be able to change it. We want to be able to change it efficiently and, sustain, uh, and sustainably. Great. Thank you. Any other questions? I would like to hear more about the procurement route and how the life cycle assessment was tied into it. Because I would assume you will start with a base life cycle assessment from the architect, from the first stages of the process. And then when it goes to tender, these contractors, they will come with different life cycle assessments in order to compete. Will that be the case? Yeah, it, it was. It, it, it was. That baseline in our case was stage two. Uh, 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 and that was the assessment that was that was made collectively by the team on, on Simon and the team's advice. But of course, that evolved through the procurement process. You're quite right. 
but what it did do, and with the encouragement and the brief, and the, the uh, we were quite careful with the uh, the RFPs, the tender documentation, to encourage uh, a reduction in, 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 in body carbon, and a host of other sustainability uh, initiatives as well. But so the, the the tender information, the offers or suggestions we're getting from the industry, we felt were relatively efficient and allowed us to meet our stretch target. So it's an ongoing effort. Ed, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I think for us, um, delivering a <coughs> very significantly sized design and build project over the last few years, Westgate, which I put the image up from, I think what we've learned is that it's very difficult <coughs> to set reduction targets per se against a, bench, uh, uh, against a, a baseline from stage two. Um, it, it does work and it incentivizes the right behaviors but it's very difficult to, um, to know at stage two what the exact amount of materials are, are, that are gonna go into the building. Um, so it's a, it's, it's a little bit like, um, you know, if, if you get the builder in and they're gonna do an extension, you know, they needed three beams and then suddenly they needed four. They needed, you know, 27 blocks and now they need 34. You, you, know, you always need a little bit more than what, than what you thought. Uh, and on a 440 million pound project, that starts to multiply. So the quantities you thought you needed at stage two end up sort of growing a little bit and maybe you need some more secondary steel work or a bit more glazing or a bit more this or a bit more that. So we found that it was very difficult for us to be able to say, as the contractor in a design and build capacity getting really involved on really early in the process, have they delivered a reduction? We're not sure. It, it, do you see what I'm getting at? It's very difficult to control those kinds of quantities. I, think, I still think you have to to incentivize in the right way, and you'll see the reduction target in our brief for that reason. Um, but it's very difficult to control these quantities as, as, as the project progresses. I think with the traditional form of procurement, things are probably a lot easier because you can basically go to that contractor and they've got a very small design portion um, and there's relatively little opportunity for that to go up or down. What we've also started doing recently is using um, pre-contract sum agreements um, with uh, contractors. So getting them in early, to actually help us with the design and to critique it and to work it through, um, which just uh, helps to bring down that uh, carbon intensity because they can advise on you know, modern methods of construction and that sort of thing very, very early on in the process, whereas ordinarily they would be left a little bit too late. So. Can I just, sorry, I just, just, just a point because Ed's reminded me, the bit I failed to say, of course, is that we, uh, our procurement was slightly different in, in that we've, we've decided to go with uh, construction management. For now, it will switch later on. So relatively early engagement was important, but all the, the principal trade contracts also had a PCSA element. So we were bringing the expertise under a PCSA appointment uh, uh, at what we think was the right time. So maybe earlier than you would normally do, but we, we needed that detailed knowledge. I think that's critical. I think that's the, the absolute best approach. Um, there was a Yes, Karine Gwenen, Environmental Advisor for Skanska. I've got a question on um, components and um, how we measure carbon. How easy is it to get data for components? Mm. I know concrete is fairly straightforward, but things like, for example, ME components, how, how accurate are you and um, how easy is it to find it? That's a very good question. I think the answer is the information is not good enough really yet. We get the information, uh, and I mentioned in the from typically from environmental product declarations um, and from for, for components and, and, and systems. However, for example, with MEP systems, there's relatively little data available out there. We have actually sort of metaphorically taken apart a Dakin Fankel unit to figure out the supply chain, the carbon cost of every component. And that is a sort of nightmarish exercise. But the way it's typically done at the moment, and but there are moves afoot in different uh, uh, in various places to improve on this. <clears throat> but at the moment, we tend to do it on a cost basis. So it's it's you know the, the, the cost of the MEP system. We're saying pro rata. That's the carbon cost. Now that is not efficient, because we know, for example, the displacement system and a Fankel system may cost the same amount, say roughly. Um, but they're going to have very different overall embodied carbon footprint. But I think with time, EPDs will come forward. Hopefully, the RAP database will um, start to collect information, and this all will get better. Um, but it's a, it's a very good point. I mean, I think generally, though, it is EPDs, 
in, in, in line with the various standards that we, uh, we outlined. Can I, um, can I add to that, Simon, before, yes, please. We, before we move on? So during my presentation, I, I alluded to a uh, component life cycle costing and embodied carbon sort of calculator that the RICS has, has released. Now, at the moment, that's very, very much focused on, on fabric, um, but we're embarking on a two-year project with London South Bank University to try and build up the uh, mechanical and electrical aspects. So we're speaking to the likes of CIPC and other providers. Mm -hmm. Um, so it is a problem, it's one that we're trying to, to, to improve. Uh, just to add to that, there is actually a, an EPD program called EcoPassport, which is based in France, but it's um, aligned to EcoPlatform and the EN15804 EPDs, and that covers HVAC. There aren't, well, there's about 400 EPD in it, but it covers the whole range of electronics, electrical. Mm. Um, Thank but you. There is data there. Thank you. Julie Godfrey from Sibzi. Uh, first of all, thank you and well done to Rix because um, we've been needing consistency on a methodology for ages. Uh, and congratulations to clients who are adopting it. Um, I think my question and comment is on pitting embodied carbon against operational, and in particular, some of the graphs that you use on the design stage assessments. Because um, we all know, first of all, that it's difficult to predict what operational carbon will be. Um, and all the time, we massively underestimate it. So what I'm worried about is that by pitting it like that, we might, A, not make the right decisions in the long term, but also we are missing all sorts of other opportunities to reduce embodied carbon. For example, reducing construction waste, having efficient shapes that you know, make us use less materials, and also loads of synergies where, for example, reducing peak loads could save embodied carbon as well as operational. We could get rid of some of our kits. So I'm, I am a bit worried that the focus on comparing embodied and operational at the moment is diverting from important issues and we don't yet know enough. Um, I, just, <coughs> I just respond yeah, to yeah, that. Yeah, go. I, I think what this guidance does is say if you want to build up a complete picture of carbon for an individual building project, then you can do it using this methodology. But I think what you can do is you can interpret it how you want to interpret it. So for us as a client, build, building and designing a building, energy efficient building is obviously the most important thing. But now we're starting to focus on the stage one to A5 emissions so that we can figure out what our embodied carbon footprint will be and then try to, to, to reduce it. But I think not to confuse what people are going to do with the standard with what the standard mm -hmm. is, because the, it's quite separate. Well, if, yeah, if, if, I could, if I could just respond quickly to Julian, I think we'll, we'll have to finish. But um, I think the, the, the first point is that we do not see this as, it, as p pitting one thing against the other, as operational against embodied. And I think I took pains to, I think, explain that it's really about looking at these two things together because they do interrelate. So that, that's the first point. I think as far as the pie charts go, they are based on the same data, which is design stage um, uh, 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 information. And so the data in the gray zones is provided not by us, but by people like ACOM, uh, Kundles, Arup, and so on. And what they're doing is doing what they do uh, uh, is provide the information at the, at the design stage of the project. The, 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 they provide the regulated, which was the dark gray bit, but the unregulated, which is the extra bit, which is taking a, an assessment into account of uh, uh, the day-to-day -day usage of uh, non-regulated uh, items, is the best we can do at the design stage because it is because that's how they design them. It is true that there is a big performance gap, and I would absolutely accept that. But I think the one thing out of all of those bits of the pie, the one thing that we do know is the dark purple bit, because you should know what the building's made of. Um, but the pale purple and the greys are, are obviously speculative at the design stage. Um, and I would agree that over time we need to improve the information and prove that. And I dare say those pie charts will change in five years' time. Um, but I'd hold this one final thought, that if you drew a pie chart for a passive house, how big would the grey be and how big would the purple be? Okay, and thank you very much. <laughs>